Hey guys, so today we're going to be looking at America's involvement in World War II. Uh, so let's just kind of recap what we've been looking at a little bit already. So we've looked at the timeline of escalation um, of the war in Europe with Hitler's invasion um, or Hitler's rise to power in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, Tojo in Japan, uh, and kind of seeing how uh, they have progressed into starting this conquering of Europe, um, finally invading Poland, being the spark that kind of begins World War II. Uh, so America at this point, when Hitler invades Poland in 1936, America is you gotta remember, we're not too far removed. We're only shy of 30 years removed from World War One. It's a pretty recent memory for a lot of Americans. And uh, like in World War One, America was really nervous about getting involved in Europe's affairs. We had seen World War One as America getting kind of entangled in something we had no business being in. Uh, and World War Two was very similar. So a lot of people in America are really kind of pushing this isolationist idea. Um, so what we're going to kind of get to see today is how America moves from this isolationist um, philosophy right up to being involved in the war. Uh, I also think it's important to remember where FDR's role in this is. So Franklin Roosevelt has just been reelected for his third presidency, um, the only president in our history to have more than two terms. So FDR would like to keep the nation as neutral and peaceful as possible. However, he also recognizes that that's probably not going to be something that we can do for long term, um, that it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to be completely isolationist. Uh, so he's going to kind of guide America through this as well. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So in 1934, um, a publication is released called The Merchants of Death. Uh, and The Merchants of Death makes these allegations uh, that a lot of businesses, banks, and things like this were pushing a lot of money into World War I, which eventually got us involved in the war. This came out and kind of as a scandal. A lot of people read this and it increased our isolationist feelings uh, and we're pretty unhappy with it. Uh, so much so that a senator called Nye, not Bill Nye the science guy, um, but a senator called Nye conducted a series of hearings for the next two years from 34 to 36 in order to investigate these claims, um, looking at some of the different industries that had been uh, accused, including a lot of the banks. Uh, the idea was that this had kind of brought America into World War I, and this was something we were looking to avoid uh, in the future. At the same time, in 1935, as Hitler is starting to get a little bit more uh, noticeable in Europe, we pass a Neutrality Act. So this was an act passed through Congress that says that we are not going to sell weapons to nations at war. Um, this again kind of comes back from that Merchants of Death thing. Um, so the idea that this is the first Neutrality Act should let you know that there is more than one. Uh, so that's in 1935. In 1936, we passed the second Neutrality Act. This says not only can we not sell weapons, we also are not going to loan money. Okay, So this is something we had kind of done a little bit in World War I, but what we're going to be doing here is trying to keep ourselves out of this. Uh, in 1937, okay, so this is just um, as Hitler is really kind of taking control. Uh, America says that we are going to remain neutral in the Spanish Civil War. So remember, the Spanish Civil War uh, was a conflict between the nationalists um, who supported the Spanish monarchy and the um, socialists who supported Franco, who was a fascist leader. Uh, officially, America was going to stay out of it. However, a lot of American men did end up volunteering, but America was officially neutral through this. So these three acts really kind of show how we don't want to be involved, right? No money, no weapons, no say in your conflicts. That's not us, right? We're, we're staying completely out of this. Um, now, FDR does, around this time, in one of his fireside chats, uh, starts to talk to the American people, and he says this really famous quote, which I think is really important to remember. He says, let no man or woman thoughtlessly or falsely talk of America sending its armies into European fields. We're not, we're not sending our men to Europe. Um, this nation will remain a neutral nation. But I cannot ask that every American remain neutral in thought as well. I have said it not once but many times that I have seen war and I hate war. And as long as it is in my power to prevent, there will be no blackout of peace in the United States. So this just kind of shows two things here. One, that FDR does want to remain neutral as long as possible. But however, he says you can't ignore this problem, right? You can't remain neutral in thought in the sense that you have to recognize that something is going on. And for as long as it is in my power, we're going to stay at peace, but recognize that may not be forever. 
right? In 1938, um, in October of that year, FDR asked Congress for $300 million to be put towards defense spending. So to start building up the Navy, start building up the Army, right? Also that year, um, Germany recalls their ambassador to the United States. Um, so this would have been Hitler's like ambassador to us. Um, this is usually something that you don't do unless you think that you're going to be going to war with someone. You don't recall your ambassador. Um, so that's kind of a sign that Germany is prepping for this. Um, we also begin a program to build about 10,000 planes. Um, this is a lot of money that's going towards defense right here in 1938. Uh, 1939, we begin what is known as the cash and carry policy. So this says that, all right, if you want to buy supplies from us, what you have to do is you have to pay cash and transport it yourself. So if you want to buy weapons from the United States, you have to pay us up front for them. We're not going to take it on credit, right? And you have to send a ship to the United States, pick it up, and bring it back home to you. Now. This goes against that neutrality act that we first had said, right? So the cash and carry policy is the first act that really goes blatantly against the neutrality act that we had passed just a few years before. It is important to remember, however, the cash and carry act was not specific to the allies. It was also, if Germany wanted to buy money from us, then they could do that as well. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, these are just a couple other quotes here uh, as the war is starting to heat up with the invasion of Poland. Um, FDR says, no man can tame a tiger into a kitten by stroking it. This refers to the appeasement policy, saying we're not going to be taming Hitler just by saying, oh, good kitty, good kitty, right? Churchill, who's the Prime Minister of Great Britain, says if Hitler invaded hell, Britain would work with the devil in order to stop him. Um, FDR and Churchill are going to go on to become pretty strong allies, um, so you can see how they are feeling about um, appeasement and about Hitler here. 1940. For the first time ever, the United States passes a peacetime draft law to draft soldiers into the military when we are not at war. What does this tell you? It should tell you that we're prepping for a war, right? That's what this is saying. Beginning of 1941, we changed the cash and carry policy into the Lend-Lease Act. The Lend-Lease Act says we are going to loan you weapons in return for the ability to lease your naval bases, right? So if we want to take our Navy to your naval bases, we are allowed to do so. You can see how this is also different from the cash and carry policy in the sense that we are loaning it, right? Why would we be doing this? Well, because by 1941, Great Britain didn't have any money, right? They're in the middle of a war. They can't afford to buy weapons with cash anymore. Um, at this point, too, we are also focusing specifically on the Allies. Um, so we're not selling money to Germany, selling weapons to Germany anymore, which pretty much just says what side we're on at this point, right? Also in 1941, um, when Japan, Japan uh, invades some islands in the, specific, in the Pacific, we decide to cut off trade with Japan. This is a big deal because Japan got a lot of their oil from us, okay? So a lot of times that you'll hear that we, uh, that Japan brought us into the war because they wanted to, right? That's not what they wanted. They didn't want another person to have to fight in this war. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor not to bring us in, but in the hopes that it would cripple us enough that they would be able to take our oil reserves in the Philippines, okay? So it begins when we cut off trade with them in July, okay? We cut off trade with Japan, and not long after that, um, we start to kind of make some deals, all right? The first thing that we do is sign the Atlantic Charter with Winston Churchill. So this is um, in August, right? So just a month after we cut off trade with Japan, Basically, FDR and Churchill meet in secret off the coast of Canada on a boat. That's where it's called the Atlantic Charter. Uh, and they come up with an agreement on if the U.S. gets involved in World War II, what do we want out of it? Okay. So the Atlantic Charter is basically right here saying we're going to eventually get involved in this war. We recognize that. So we want to let you know up front what we want out of it. Um, so if you look at this here, this is just some of the things that were involved in the Atlantic Charter. No territorial gains are going to be sought by the U.S. or the United Kingdom. Territorial adjustments must be made in accord to the wishes of the people concerned. So at the end of the war, when we start drawing new borders, the people have to be have a say. 
all people have the right to self-determination. Trade barriers are going to be lowered. There's going to be um, global economic cooperation and the advancement of social welfare. We're going to try and enforce freedom of want and fear. We're going to talk more about what that means in a little bit. Talk about freedom of the seas so people can trade freely on the open seas. And that there is going to be a post-war disarmament and international organization. So this is similar to the League of Nations. So if you look at what these are all about here, this is basically trying to stop the same problems that we had at the end of World War I. Um, so at the end of World War I, uh, there were a lot of issues, right, that ended up causing World War II. This is kind of saying we are going to avoid that this time, right? But again, by making U.S. aims that are saying this is what we want out of this war, that's not saying if we get involved, that's saying when we get involved, right? So um, right after that, so that was in August, in November, the Japanese um, leader Tojo sends a peace envoy to Washington, D.C. to try and negotiate some plans um, with the U.S. government about whether or not um, we are going to be able to resume trade, okay? So look at this. This is in November, right? Well, in December, we all know what happens. On December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Oahu is bombed by Japanese planes. This is a big deal, okay? The attack on Pearl Harbor was very much planned um, weeks in advance, uh, maybe even months in advance. Uh, it was a surprise attack while there were peace envoys in Washington, D.C., right? Uh, this is kind of the last straw, as you can imagine. Uh, there was a movie, Tora, 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 that came out um, in the 40s, I think, uh, where this quote comes from this movie where it says, um, we have awoken a sleeping giant. The Japanese leaders never actually said that, but that's kind of what happened. By attacking Pearl Harbor, we're really going to get involved in this war. Um, we take it as a personal offense as it was. Thousands of Americans are killed, um, and this is the last straw. So, uh, we're going to continue kind of taking a look at this here. Uh, so that's where we will pick up. All right. All right, guys. So now we are going to be taking a look at the lead up um, and the effects of what actually happened in Pearl Harbor on that Sunday morning. Okay. Um, so just a real quick little um, review again, just to get a little bit more specific here. Um, July of 1941, after Japan invades some places in the Pacific, we cut off trade with them. Um, specifically, what they're most worried about is our trade with oil. Um, Japan decides at that point that they need to find a way to take our oil reserves, specifically the ones that we have in the Philippines. So they need to cripple our Navy in order to be able to take control of our oil. Okay, our Navy is pretty much all in Pearl Harbor. Um, the island of Hawaii is almost center between Japan and California, the United States. Um, and so it's a really perfect location for Japan to be able to plan and implement an attack. Um, in November of that year, uh, Tojo sends a peace envoy to the United States to throw us off guard. Um, basically, they send an envoy to Washington, D.C. that is trying to, in theory, come up with a way to um, resume trade and remain peaceful. Uh, on December 6th, all peace talks are officially rejected by Japan. So everything that we have been doing since the envoy arrived in November, Japan basically comes back on the 6th and says, yeah, never mind, we don't like the terms, we're leaving. And then on December 7th, 1941, the private surprise attack on Pearl Harbor was implemented. Um, so just as kind of a quick little overview of what is going on here, this is something I'm sure you've heard about, um, but I thoroughly think that it's important to know kind of the details of what was happening that morning. Um, so Pearl Harbor took place um, on about 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's on the island of Oahu, which is one of the bigger islands of Hawaii. Um, the Imperial Navy um, had 
sh uh, brought ships um, with aircraft, brought aircraft carriers with waves of planes um, in order to fly in and to attack. They had been planning for several weeks, maybe even months, um, before the attack. Um, it was a surprise attack conceived by Japanese Admiral Yamamoto. Um, there were about 353 Japanese aircraft that were involved in this uh, particular attack. There were approximately 100 U.S. naval ships um, present in Pearl Harbor that morning, um, including several different kinds of um, battleships, destroyers, cruisers, as well as some other smaller support ships. Um, However, luckily, about half of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was out to sea, including our aircraft carriers. This is going to become really important for us after the attack. Um, there was also on Hawaii, and I'll show you a map of this in just a second, uh, an airfield, which was an Army airfield called Hickam Field. Um, Hickam Field was also a victim of the surprise attack. Basically, anywhere that we had um, ships or planes or anything was um, subject to attack that morning. Um, there were about 18 Army aircraft carriers, including bombers, fighters, and attack bombers that were destroyed or damaged on the ground. However, a few of the pilots managed to get um, into the air that morning uh, against the invaders. They kind of tried to fight them off as best they could. Obviously, not very many were able to do so. Uh, however, they do make a pretty good account of themselves. Uh, a total of 29 Japanese aircraft are shot down by ground fire, either um, from men who are firing from the ships with anti-aircraft guns or from the U.S. pilots um, from the various military installations on the island of Oahu. Um, however, that day was vicious. You know, it's a Sunday morning, right? Like. People are sleeping in late, or they got up and went to church that morning. Uh, it's not something that you know they're expecting. We're not at war, right? They're in paradise. It's Hawaii. Like, what could possibly go wrong? Um, however, when the surprise attack hits, it changes everything for the American military. Uh, I also think it's important to remember that this is basically an act of terrorism. There had been no formal declaration of war, despite the fact that we had shown that we were not really um, as neutral as we claim to be, we had not made any outright um, threats against Japan or Germany or anywhere else. Uh, this was just a way for Japan to make sure that they crippled our Navy enough that they could take over um, a lot of our oil reserves. So I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm going to warn you that some of these pictures are pretty tough to look at, um, but I do think they show you the good impact of what uh, really happened in Pearl Harbor that day. Uh, so this is just kind of shows you where at 7.55 that morning, just before the attacks happened, where all of the different ships were in the harbor. Uh, so you can see that these are, um, th the ships are actually clumped really close together. Uh, this was a major issue because that meant like fire could spread from one ship to the other. Um, you see these bigger ships right here. These are some of the battleships. Um, particularly, I want to point out the Maryland, Oklahoma, the Tennessee, the West Virginia, the Arizona. Okay, um, so you can kind of see where they are. You can see that Hickam Field is going to be a little bit more southeast uh, here as we are looking at this. So this is the island of Oahu itself. You can see Pearl Harbor is uh, in the south of the island. So these two images show where the Japanese planes went in. So the first wave of attack began at 7.55 that morning uh, and they came in on the west side of the island. A few of them went to Wheeler, which was an airfield over here, um, but most of the attack flew down and around. These are going to be more high-level bombers. Um, they had actually uh, made some like wooden fins on the bombers that are on the torpedoes that it made them to go into the shallow water a little bit easier. Um, so the first wave came in, dropped their bombs here. Uh, an hour later at 8.54 a.m., the second wave came in. This one went to more of the fields. You can see the airfields uh, were hit a little bit harder in the second wave. These are mostly fighter pilots. Uh, there was actually a planned third wave, but they ended up deciding not to initiate that third wave, seeing that they had inflicted as much damage um, as they already had. So just some pictures here. Um, the dry docks are where like ships are taken to be cleaned or um, to be repaired. 
So these are some ships that are burning in the dry docks that morning. Uh, you can see obviously a lot of smoke, a lot of fire. These, you know, these are ships that run on oil. They're flammable, essentially. Um, and they're basically like tin cans. Like the men are trapped inside of them. Um, and that fire is going to cause it to heat up. Uh, if you ever, you know, seen metal in a microwave, that's kind of what this is like. Um, this is one of the airfields and you can just see how huge the smoke from the attack uh, really is here. Uh, this is the USS Arizona. Uh, so the Arizona is the ship that was hit the hardest. Uh, it actually capsized under water. Uh, it still resides in Pearl Harbor today. Uh, they never took the ship out. Uh, and so you can just see, I mean, how scary is that, right? Like how dangerous. Uh, again, just seeing the devastation here from what was going on. Um, this is just a shot from above. Uh, you can see the oil leaking from the ships, just the damage. Um, that was how I showed you all the battleships that were lined up. You can see how that happened there. Uh, this one I think is really telling. Look at these guys, you know, these are guys, and this is after the attack. These guys are like 18, 19 years old. You know, they joined the Army and the Navy thinking that they're going to have time of their lives and meet nurses and it's going to be great. But if you look at the look on some of these guys' faces, right, they're shocked. They don't even know how to handle this sort of terror. Uh, and it's something that has finally made the war really real uh, for these guys. Um, this again is from Hickam Airfield. You can see the damage of the planes here. This is one of the ships. Um, afterwards, you can just see just the devastation. So we're going to listen now uh, to FDR's formal declaration of war speech. This was given on December 8th, um, so the very next day where he asked Congress for a declaration of war. The speech was um, broadcast over the radio. Millions of Americans listened in. Uh, it's not a very long speech, but it kind of goes through what happened and what Japan had done. Um, so you've got some questions that kind of go along with this. So I really want you to think about um, the argument that FTR uses here in the speech. I'm going to actually play the speech for you. Um, but as you can see, the writing is also on the overhead if you have a hard time understanding some of what he is saying. Um, so let's go ahead and listen up. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate, of the House of Representatives. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation, and at the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with its government and its emperor, looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleague delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. And while this reply stated that it seemed useless to continue the existing diplomatic negotiations. It contained no threat or hint of war or of armed attack. It will be recorded that the distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the intervening time, the Japanese government has deliberately sought to deceive the United States by false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. 
the attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense, but always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us, to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph so help us God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Okay, so as we rise up, 
uh, wrap up talking about Pearl Harbor, um, I just want to give you a little bit of statistics here. Uh, so a little over 2,500 2, people died in less than the two hours of the attack. Um, a thousand people um, were wounded uh, and nearly 300 airplanes and 18 American ships were destroyed. Over half of the casualties of Pearl Harbor took place on board just one ship, the USS Arizona. Uh, the USS Arizona, as I said before, capsized in the midst of the attack. It was hit with four different torpedoes um, and turned upside down, uh, trapping the men inside of it. Thousands of men, um, over a thousand men inside that ship. Uh, when they were attempting rescues of the Arizona for hours after the attack, they could hear tapping from the men inside the hull as they were saying where they are, you know, we're here, we're here, until eventually those men suffocated and drowned uh, inside the Arizona. And as I said today, the USS Arizona still lies in Pearl Harbor as a memorial to the men who died. Um, they never pulled it back up uh, because it serves as their tomb, the men who were killed inside of it. I was um, able to go to Pearl Harbor a few years ago uh, and I have some pictures that I just want to show you. So this is a photograph that I took just outside of the harbor. Um, the white thing here, this is the walkway that you now walk on. It stands above the USS Arizona. This ship over here is the USS Missouri. The USS Missouri plays a pretty important role in the end of the war um, and this became her resting place. Uh, as you can see she is got her guns pointed just over the Arizona. Um, so you can see in this picture here, her guns are pointed over the Arizona to the mainland. Uh, she stands in defense of the Arizona and the men who died there. Um, that is the symbolism of how her guns are still pointed to this day. Um, so these are some of the remains of the ship under the water. Uh, so you can see pretty clearly um, the remains here. This is just one of the oil rigs of the ship. Uh, if you look really carefully, you'll notice that this water um, has a shimmer to it. That is oil. There's still oil leaking out of the Arizona. There is enough oil left in the USS Arizona to be leaking out for the next 10 years. Uh, it's already been underwater since 1941. So that just kind of tells you a little bit of um, how big and devastating this really was. Uh, this is just an aerial view. I obviously didn't take this picture, um, but this is the rig that you just saw here. So you can see the Arizona um, still lying underneath the water's surface. Um, thousands of people visit the Arizona every day as a memorial um, to the men who died. Uh, Pearl Harbor was the most devastating attack on American soil until September 11, 2001. Um, it became a rallying cry for people. Uh, there was no more talk of neutrality with, you know, headlines like this all over the country, um, that we are going to war. America was united in this front. We had been attacked. Um, Japan was first on our list. As soon as we declared war on Japan as uh, Japanese allies, Germany then declared war on us um, just a few days later, as well as Italy. And we eventually pledged ourselves to the war in Europe as well as to the war in the Pacific. Um, so the next few uh, lectures we're going to be looking at kind of how the U.S. mobilizes to get ready for war, uh, how the war is taking place, uh, the different battles and some of the different things that were fought. Uh, but just always remember, you know, I think it's easy for us for, to forget Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's easy for us to forget the devastation that it caused and the effects that it has still on, you know, um, people whose families suffered through it and what it meant for people at the time in 1941. Um, the sense of revenge and the sense of um, dignity and honor that it brought to our country are really important for understanding why we eventually got involved in World War I. Um, so, with that said, I will see you guys soon.